So let's study the book of Romans. We are in Romans chapter 13, and we're going to continue looking at uh, what God says to us concerning our attitude and our relationship to the government. And you go, oh, brother, oh, brother, because this ain't easy. Uh, I struggled with this one, just opening the page to Romans 13 and going, submit to the government. You know, yeah, right. And it's an election year, which makes it even more double hard because we want our team to win. Now, politics in itself has a lot of interesting things about it, and you enjoy watching the politics happen, but it's very frustrating too. Because if our side does not win, and the other side that's whacked, they have crazy ideology, they have corrupt people, our side we want to win, the other side is corrupt and whacked. And with the other side, evil rules the day. Now, that's what the other side thinks about our side, too. And I didn't say which side, either, did I? I want our side to win because the other side is evil and corrupt. And if they win, the country is ruined, right? That's why Mike's teaching about preaching about the government so difficult, especially some of the things that Paul says. And that's what it feels like to me. Every time I look at it, I want my side to win because my side's right and the other side is wrong. I want to read the whole text of these first seven verses of Romans. We're going to cover, try to cover three of them today, which is going to be difficult for me, but we, I think I can pull it off. We'll see. Let's just read verse, uh, Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's what we studied last Sunday. Verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent, an agent of wrath to bring judgment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. That's the text that we're studying today and probably uh, another week or two also. We'll see what happens with that one too. But our responsibility, our assignment from God, our task from God, the command that he gives us is to submit to the governing authorities regardless of who they are. And when Paul wrote that, Nero was the emperor of Rome. So, not a good person. And you think we have the, the other side is corrupt, or our side is corrupt. Whoever you are listening to me say, our politics is corrupt. We're nothing compared to Nero. Maybe some of them are. So we have this responsibility to be submitting to those who have power as I said last time, to kick us around. It has nothing to do with their personal merit, who they are, what they, what they look like, what their characteristics are, what their personality traits are, or even what their ideology is. We, we submit to them simply because they are the governing authorities. Just because of who they are, period. And they're in power, they're in authority, they are in the government because God put them there. God not only established the government in a general sense that there's such a thing as government, he established all the, distinct all the distinct governments of all the different places in the world. Every geopolitical boundary that has a government in it, God established that one too. And God not only established that government, he established the leaders who are in that government and put them there from the top down. And you submit to the government simply because God is the one who ordained it. And us Christians are to submit to it. Us Christians are to 
obey it. To do what the government says for us to do. Christians, that's who Paul's writing this letter to. And he says everybody, he means the whole, everybody in the world has to submit to the government, but he means Christians. To Nero, to the Roman authorities, and to whoever it is that's in power. That's what we studied last time. But let's keep moving today. I'm going to cover three verses today. Romans 13, verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And here it starts to get a little bit more close to home. You can say, I submit to the government because God ordained it so. And just because he's sovereign and I love him, I'll do what he says. But here we have a real genuine negative reason why you're to submit to the government. It'll cost you more than you want to pay if you don't. It's different than, I'll submit to him just because God said it. Now, I've got to submit to him because it's not going to be pleasant for me if I don't. You will bring judgment on yourself, Paul says. He's, let me back up for a second. He says, consequently. It's the Greek word just means therefore. The conclusion and the logical result of what he just said in verse 1. That what he just said about God's sovereignty and government. Because of God's sovereignty and government, therefore, he who rebels against that authority. I like this too. It's uh, two words. There's two words translated rebel in the English Bible. Most of them have that word, or resist, or something like that. But the first word uh, that's used here means to arrange against, to array against. The, the picture is like you have an army on a battlefield, and you've, arrayed all, you've aligned all your troops and set them up ready to go to battle against another army on the other side of the hill or the other side of the valley. And you're arrayed in, in rebellion. You're arrayed in opposition. You are arranged your army to fill, uh, fill out against the enemy forces. You're ready for battle. You are opposing someone, both the psychological attitude and in the behavior that you do. You don't like them, and you're going to fight them. That's what rebel means. That's what that word means. You are opposed to. You are hostile toward. You show hostility. You set one's, it means to set oneself against, to oppose, resist, withstand. He who withstands himself against the authorities. He who opposes the authorities. That same word is translated several times. Well, a lot of times it's just translated oppose. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, Scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He opposes proud. That's the same word. He rebels against people who are proud. It needs to be emphasized, too, um, because all of us are sinners, and uh, some of us are, uh, are more into this than others, but all of us have bad days with the government. government. Um, it needs to be emphasized. He's talking about someone who has a lifestyle of habitually resisting authority. Resisting the government, opposing the government, opposing those who have a right to kick you around. They have the right to kick you around because God gave them that right to kick you around. And there are people who have an attitude and a, a behavior to resist that all the time. That's what Paul is talking about here. And if that's you, then you have opposed what God has ordained. You have opposed what God has instituted, decreed, ordered. We looked at this last time. This was the whole sermon last time or the last part of the sermon last time, God ordained it. God instituted the government. God made them happen. He arranged in place. He ordained. He designated, appointed the government. God did it. He set the government in place. He set the rulers in place. And if you rebel, then you're rebelling against what he set up in place. You are opposing what God has set up. You're rebelling against God's order. That's why you can't do it. You're rebelling against what God has established. <clears throat> he says, um, he who rebels, that's the first word, against the authority, is rebelling against what God has instituted. And he used a different word. Translated rebelling both times, or rebel in the English. Uh, and the words are basically syn synonymous. They mean the, virtually the exact same thing. This word is, the, I want to say the Greek word, it's anti 
antihistamine. We get an English word antihistamine from it. Synonym to the first word, it means to set oneself against, to resist, to oppose, whether in deed or word. It means to arrange in battle against someone. You set yourself up against someone in battle. That's the same. It's a different word. It means the same thing. He who rebels and sets himself up against uh, the governing authority sets himself up against what God has ordained. That's, what's, that's what he's saying here. The government. You have rebelled against the institution that God has made. Now here's the irony for us as Americans. If you weren't Americans, I could be preaching to you a whole different kind of a thing. But because you're Americans and you're used to living in a country that has a constitution that establishes and guarantees you a lot of freedoms. Crazy freedoms. People, other places in the world have no idea when you talk about freedom. When you just read the Bill of Rights. You mean we can gather and we can believe whatever we want to believe and the government can't do anything about it? That's the first one. Here's the irony, though. The founders of the United States rebelled against, the England, against England, against King George. They broke Romans 13, verse 1. They violated that. And then they wrote an amendment in the Constitution, the Second Amendment, which basically gives the citizens the necessary means to resist the very government that they created. That's what the Second Amendment's about. If the government gets crazy and starts to violate this Constitution, you guys pick up your weapons and fight them. Just like we did King George. That's the irony. It's crazy. You, won't, you don't set up a power, you don't set up a government and then give the, the citizens the right to rebel against the government, government. But they did. I really don't know how to address it. But you are rebelling against the government if you're rebelling against the government, whether it's got a constitution or not, you're opposing God. Even if the framers of the constitution established a, a clause in there or an idea in there that gives you the right to rebel and protest and make a stink at the White House, in front of the Congress, at the Supreme Court, you can go up there and, and protest. And rebel. Isn't that crazy? But if you do that, you're rebelling against what God has established. It's part of our fundamental laws, isn't it? To protest. The United States has established a constitution that gives you a right to protest, but if you protest, you're violating what God says. I don't know how to deal with that. I really don't know how to deal with that. But it hasn't been that way for most of human history. This is, this is relatively a new thing. To go out and protest in front of a cop and not get arrested. But you can't do it. Because if you, if you set yourself up against them, against the government, you will receive judgment, Paul says. Judgment will happen to you. And Paul doesn't mean judgment like the day of judgment when God judges. He means judgment in the form of a temporal punishment by the government. You'll receive your judgment from the civil authorities. The civil authorities are the means of enforcing that people live peaceably together without uncontrolled crime and evil. The civil authorities have that right from God to punish people so that the, government, so that the uh, country doesn't turn into chaos. We'll talk some more about that. And it's kind of crazy because, I mean, this, Paul wrote this when Nero was government, Nero was the emperor, and the Romans, I mean, you were talking about corruption, it was a corrupt place. And they knew it because they lived in that town. That's who this letter was written to, the Romans. They could probably walk down the street and see Nero. But the control that the government has may seem uh, insidious to us, and the reason why it seems um, madness to us is because we're used to freedom because of the motivation that we have to, to keep in step, to not resist, to not rebel against the government. Do you know what that is? Verse 3. For rulers hold no, no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. 
It's just the word for leaders, rulers, officials, magistrates. Most of the time in the New Testament, that word is translated ruler. Rulers who hold, have no terror. And whoever's in charge, the president, the governor, the mayor, the cops, uh, whoever, they have a way, they have authority from God, they have a way to bring terror into your life. And he uses the word terror. It's the Greek word phobos. We get phobia from it. It means fear. The government, the motivation for their ruling you, the motivation they place upon your soul, the motivation they put into your conscience, the motivation that they bring to your soul is fear, terror. But it's only for those who cause trouble. It's only for those who do wrong, who disobey and break the law. That's who the terror is for. For people who do not stretch the limit and push the buttons and make the system rock and cause problems, there's no fear. For those who break the law, there's fear. For those who don't break the law, there's no reason to be afraid. The motivation to be afraid of the government is either minimized or averted altogether if you don't break the law. If you live uh, in submission to the government, there's no reason to be afraid. Now, Having said that, I know uh, sometimes people are just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I used to drive on from Raleigh to Wake, Wake Forest to Raleigh to go to work when I was in seminary, and there'd be a car, 50 cars, and everybody's flying. And the highway patrolman would just pull the last car in line. Nobody else got a ticket, only the last one, so don't be the last car in line. Somebody's going to get a ticket. Whoever doesn't get in the middle is going to get it. <clears throat> but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about being at the wrong place in the wrong time. He's talking about people who are always living in disobedience along with the same attitude, just a disobedient attitude. They can't stand the government. If they see a cop, they want to go say something to him. Smarty breeches. People like that. And that should be no Christian ever. No Christian ever should be that way. Having an attitude of resistance and rebellion to the government, ever. No Christian should have that attitude. Verse 3, do you, want to feel, do you want to be free from fear of the one who in authority? Do you want to be free? Do you want to not have a, 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 a fearful day? And do what is right, and he will commend you. I already gave it away, but you know the best illustration for that? This is for me. I know it's for all of you, too. Uh, I know some of you told me these stories before. It's pretty much the story of our lives. You're driving down the road on 544 up here, and you see a highway patrolman sitting there right there at that bridge, 31 Bridge. And immediately, your heart stops, and you look down at your, your and you, you pump the brake, slow down just a little bit, and you haven't even looked at the speedometer yet. You don't even know how fast you're really going. You just saw the cop there, and you, your heart started pumping fast, and you were scared, thinking, oh, no, I'm going get, to get a ticket. And then you look at your speed. Find out you weren't even speeding. Just because you know you've been speeding before. And you probably, some of you have even got tickets before for speeding before. And as soon as you see a, a highway patrol car or a police car parked on the side, you slam on the brakes even if he's parked at the donut shop. What happens when you have a habit of speeding? If that's the way you are and you weren't even speeding, speeding, what happens to people who have a habit of speeding, who are always flying down the road? What do they do when they see a cop? Every time, they're afraid. You slam on the brakes and you panic in fear, hoping that you don't see the blue light come on. And that's just a silly illustration. There were no highway patrolmen in Rome. But that's, what, that, that's what we're talking about. That's a, a good illustration of fear of breaking the law. Because they're out there. Sunday morning, I see them pull people out here all the time. Sunday morning. People coming over that bridge, flying. I see it. Now, if your intentions and your thoughts are... Uh, and your desire is to always be conscientious, uh, have a sincere conscious conscience and uh, desire to do favor for the government 
including law enforcement officials, you will probably never have anything ever to worry about. If your attitude is, I like the government, I want to make the government work, pleasing to the policeman, I want to be pleasing to the... Peter says all the same stuff. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. I read this last week, but it's imp- uh, appropriate this time too. Uh, Submit yourself to the, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to the governors, This is what he says, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. If you do right, you what? You get what? Commended. If you do wrong, you get what? A speeding ticket, among other things. The next three verses, verse 15 through 17, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men. You're free. It's especially appropriate for us. We're in a free country, and we have Christ. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Look at this. Honor the king. Now, who was the king when Peter wrote that? Nero. Honor the king. Do you think Nero's going to come after you with his Gestapo squad if you're honoring him, if you're showing him honor? And your heart is to show honor to the king? Probably not. Probably not ever going to have to worry about it. Peter writes, verse 20, three verses later, how is it, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? You did something wrong, you got in trouble, and you got fined, you got a ticket, you got a beating, and you endure it. You say, oh, man, I just have to put up, take up my cross, but you got a beating for doing something wrong. Uh, how is that any good? If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, endure it, it is commendable before God. How does it, commend, how's it commend you if you did something wrong and got a beating? Nothing. Doesn't do anything good for you or God. It says in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 14, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Now, there are people who don't like you because you're a Christian, so they are going to harm you. They're going to persecute you just because you belong to Christ. But who's really going to harm you if you're eager to do what's good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Now, I'm saying all that because I want to to revisit something I talked about last time. This is where I want to deal with it again. No government, this is, this is my view, this is the view, historical view of Baptist. This is the historical view that I have or a view that I hold. The government has no right to command a person's conscience. They can't tell you you have to go uh, be a spy against people who you like. They, they really can't. They can try, they can make a law, but they can't really bind your conscience. And they don't really have a right to make a law against your conscience. So there are times when a believer must, by obeying God, incur the wrath of man. If you're trusting God and you're following Christ and you're living in compliance and obedience to his word revealed to us in the scripture... Sometimes they're just going to come get you. Because what you're trying to do is opposite of what they're telling you to do. Or what you're trying not to do is opposite of what they're telling you to do. And just be, be prepared to pay the penalty when that day comes. Without any undue complaint either. It's like, I'm not complaining. I'm not going to do what you told me to do if it violates God's word. I'm going to do what God says even if you tell me not to. And if you punish me, I'm not going to complain. Say the examples we looked at last week, you had the Egyptian midwives. They were not killing the baby Hebrew boys, right? Kill the boys. Uh, These women had compassion on these little babies, and they didn't kill the baby boys. They lied about it too, and they didn't get in any trouble. 
They didn't get any retribution against them by the king or anyone. In fact, they lied to the king, and he believed their story, and God blessed them. Egyptian midwives gave them families of their own. But, you know, they could have been in big trouble. wonder what the penalty would have been for them if they had gotten found out. What would the fine be? If the king of Egypt found out you lied to him and didn't kill the Hebrew boys like he told you, what would have happened to the Egyptian midwives? They probably uh, would have been executed. I don't know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said to, he, he made a big statue. He said, everybody bow down to the statue when you hear the trumpet. They said, we're not going to do it. And guess what happened to them? They were thrown into the fire, heated up seven times hotter than normal because the king was furious with them. Furious that they didn't obey him. Furious that they didn't believe what he said that was going to happen. They just said, we don't care what you say. God spared them through a miraculous appearance in the fire. But they were willing to suffer for doing right. They were willing to suffer according to their own conscience and their convictions concerning what God said to them in his word. You shall bow down to no other idol. And they didn't. Daniel, that was, that was in Hebrew, Daniel 3, Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel didn't pray to the king who said he had to make it, he made a law saying, everyone has to pray to the king now for the next 30 days. Well, Daniel went up in his room and opened the window and prayed to, uh, toward Jerusalem every day, like he always did. They found out about it, and guess what happened to Daniel? He was thrown into a lion's den to be killed and eaten. That's what was going to happen to Daniel. Now, the king liked Daniel, so he was all bummed out when he found out that he got tricked. But he couldn't change the law. Daniel wouldn't obey the law. Daniel's going to pray to God, not the king. And if he get, gets eaten by a lion, so be it. But God... Um, spared him too. Made the lions not hungry all of a sudden. And you had the Peter and John and the apostles who defied the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin. They kept talking about Jesus even after they were told not to talk about Jesus. You guys don't teach in this name anymore. And they threatened them. Now my... my ex, uh, it doesn't say what the threats were, but you can go ahead and tell it. If, you, if we hear any more word about this Jesus fella and you blaming us for his death, we're going to flog you. Who cares? They said, we can't help speaking what we have heard and seen. And then we, if, to, be, to obey God or you, we're going to obey God, not you, not men. And they went back and prayed. They got... They were scolded, and they were threatened, and instead of stop preaching about Jesus, they went back to their uh, prayer meeting and prayed and became bold and preached it even more. And Sanhedrin was really upset about it this time, and they wouldn't, uh, because they didn't obey him, and they wouldn't keep quiet, and they, th they uh, it says in verse 33, chapter 5, when they heard this, they were furious, and they wanted to put them to death. So... Not obeying the governor, not obeying the leaders, not obeying the authorities that are over you, official authorities ordained by God, even though they are so whacked and out of place and wrong, they have the authority to kill you. And they were mad and wanted to put them to death, and they flogged them severely. All the apostles, they were flogged. And they went back rejoicing that they're worthy to suffer for the name. They didn't complain. They were glad that they suffered for Christ. Every time a Christian suffered for the sake of the gospel because they had to obey God rather than men, they endured it. And they only broke the law. The only time they broke the law was when it was conflicting with what God commanded them. If the law didn't conflict with God's command, you comply with the law. You do what the law says. And even Paul, when we were, when we were preaching Acts, um, he was flogged in Philippi. Now, he didn't even break a law. There was no law that said you can't preach uh, the gospel. 
They didn't even know what the gospel was in Philippi. And there was no law that said you can't cast out a demon. They don't even know what that was. So there's no law that he broke. But he was unjustly beaten. And he used his rights as a Roman citizen to get some justice, not because he broke laws. All he did was cast out a demon, right? Hey, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing's wrong with that. Well, then why'd you beat me? And I'm a Roman citizen. So we're not talking about obeying the government against your own conscience or God's word. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the government that gives you laws that for the most part, you know it, you know it. They are good laws. And pretty much every kind of government there are in, there is in the world, every kind has a lot of good laws. Even countries where they don't have a constitution like ours. Do what is right, and he will commend you. Do what is right, and he will commend you. You do good, you have good behavior, and you will have his praise. That's what the word command means. He will praise you. He will be like, man, these people who obey my laws are great citizens. I like them, and he's going to tell everybody. The word means to speak of the excellence of a person, to recognize and approve of you. If you're eager to do what's good, if you're doing good and you're doing what's right, you're going to get praise from the government. You're going to get commended from the government. You're going to get recognition and approval from the government. They will speak of how excellent you are as a citizen. That same word is used in Romans 2.29. If a man is a Jew, he is one out inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Praise. Now, immediately you start to think, well, I'm not in it to get the man's praise from the government. I didn't, I didn't come into this world and become a Christian so the government could pat me on the back and say, what a good citizen you are. I'm not here to receive the praise of men. I could care less about his praise or his condemnation. But my, my struggle with that attitude is this. If me trying to get praise from the government is not a good thing, if it's not good to do that, if you shouldn't be trying that, then why did Paul write that in there? Why is that in the text? Why is it in the text? Do what's right and he will commend you. Well, I want him to commend us. I want him to commend me. I want the president and the governors and the mayors. I want them to like me. I want them to leave me alone. I want to not be afraid of them. And not only do I not want to be afraid of them and not be afraid of them and for them to leave me alone, I want them to tell everybody how good of a citizen I am. Our goal as Christians concerning the government, government is to be the best citizens in the whole world. The best citizens they have should be you. You're the best citizen the United States has ever had. You ever thought about that? That should be your attitude. Even if they don't like the gospel, they will have to be impressed with how well we comply with the laws of the land. We want to be known as model citizens. Really. That's what I think Paul means here. That's what he means. Proverbs 14, verse 35, it says... A king delights in a wise servant, but a shameful servant incurs his wrath. Now, that's technically talking about servants who serve the king. A lazy bum going to make you mad. Does the job right every time is going to make him glad and delights him. It's going to make him mad. Proverbs 20, verse 2, A king's wrath is like the roar of a lion. He who angers him forfeits his life. Don't make the king mad. Be the kind of citizen that does not make him mad, make him delight in you so that he commends you. And even when our government, bless their heart, bless their heart, that means poor, you know, morons. Um, even when our government is not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and so many times they are not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Now that's especially uh, the case around here these days. 
watch the news or watch a, a good news feed on Facebook. Like it was in Philippi. You know, Philippi, all these people, they lost their money for this girl getting exercised from a demon that Paul did. Next thing you know, they've got Paul arrested and been beat to death. He didn't do anything wrong. Now, the government let that happen. Why did the governor? Why did the government let that happen in Philippi? Shouldn't have let that happen. They should have at least found out first whether Paul was a citizen or not. And then we could have investigated whether he caught, did something wrong or not before we beat him. So even if they violate your constitutional rights, even if they do something wrong and don't do it the right way, which they do a lot, really they do. This whole COVID-19 episode is just a, a dictionary, a list of those kinds of things. Even when they do it wrong, verse 4 says, He is a servant, he is God's servant to do you good. The government is God's servant. Those in authority, from the highest levels to the lowest levels, Paul calls them God's servant. In fact, he calls them God's servants three times in this text, these first seven verses. He calls the government God's servant three times. Four times. Look that up. I don't remember if it's three or four. But it's not the same thing as a servant, like a servant of God who's a minister or a gospel preacher or a prophet or anything like that. This is, this is the Greek word diakonos. We get deacon from it. It just means a servant. He is God's servant in the sense that he administers the government which God instituted. He is the administrator of the governing authority that God ordained. He is the administrator of this uh, realm of governmental control and authority. That's what he he serves. And we honestly, we need to think about it like this. We do. The president, everybody who does not like the president, listen to me. And everybody who didn't like the last president, listen to me. And everyone who's not going to like the next president, listen to me. The president, the governor, the mayor, the police, and all who work for God, they all work for God. They serve him whether they know it or not, they serve God. And when you conscientiously follow the laws and do good in society, you bless that servant. When you conscientiously make yourself the kind of citizen that likes to live in compliance with the government's rules and laws, you bless him and you make his service to God an easier thing to do. And when you do that, Peter called that honor the king. You honor the king when you do what his, what his laws say. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about complying with the rules and with the orders of the king. Honor him. That's the way you should think. That's the way you should think as a Christian citizen of whatever country you're part of, where you live. Here in America, we have it made. We have it made. Like I should feel guilty for saying that. We have it made. It should be easy for us with a good conscience to comply with the king, to be a good citizen. Because his job is to make it so that you can live a quiet and peaceful life. The king, the governor, the authorities, their jobs are to make it so that you and I can live a quiet and peaceful life to bless us, to do good for us, to do good. When there's less crime, is that good for society or bad? If there's more crime, is that good for society or bad? That's bad. If there's less crime, that's good. And if he's out there busting up criminals, then society is blessed and your life is good. You don't have to worry about going outside and getting robbed. It's good for everybody. Society is functional because the government is there. That's what doing you good is. It's totally unlike in the, uh, in the book of Judges. Uh, there's a phrase that's used f four times. It 
says in Judges 17, verse 6, 18, verse 1, 19, verse 1, 21, verse 25, it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. You had no king. You had no government telling you what to do, how to live, and you just did whatever you wanted to do. And all you have to do is read those last three chapters of Judges, those last four chapters of Judges, and you'll see how, how crazy it was there. Chaos. In today's world, all it would take would be a few days. I'll take that back. In today's world, all it would take would be a few hours of no government. And chaos would take over very quickly in our country. Chaos. Is that good? No. Is that what you want? No. Well then, make it easy for the government to rule. This is pretty much true of every single type of government there is, from monarchies to communist governments to socialist governments to dictatorships to free democratic republics like ours, where the government exists. It's good for the citizens. Not foolproof, and there are some bad ones. But that's the rule. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 13. Verse 4 says, But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant. There's another time. The third time he says it. He is God's servant. The second time he says it. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. If you don't obey his laws, you better start worrying. You're always going to be paranoid that the cops are always out there watching you. If you're always breaking the law, if you're always doing something underhanded, you're, you're like this, looking for cops, thinking there's a spy out to get you. It's true. They have eyes on you. They're coming to come get you. You have fear of serious retribution and penalty, even deadly force. That's what the word sword means. Sword is not a tool for writing citations. A sword is not a tool for spanking you. You know what a sword is for? For killing you. Got a sh sh two, two sharp edges. All you do is whack and your head's gone. And I would say that's the epitome of what I would consider wrath. If, if it comes down to the time where the where the law officer or the government official takes the sword and whacks your head off, uh, you're, a, you're a, um, a recipient of wrath. And it's not his wrath either. It's God's wrath. He's a servant, God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. He's an agent of God's wrath. His job is to enforce not his own wrath, but God's wrath. His job is to enforce uh, the rules and bring temporal judgment on those who disobey the rules. Capital crime deserves capital punishment. And I'm going to tell you the truth right now. Uh, it's not just a political ideology. This is what the scriptures teach. Whenever you do not punish someone with a capital punishment, even though they've committed a capital crime, chaos starts to rule the land. And you have a whole country now where... It takes forever to put someone to death who murdered 10 people. It's crazy. They, have, they can execute you. They can put you in jail. They can fine you if you break the law. And the point is this. Coercive force is the motivation to not go crazy in society and start killing people. Coercive force to bring fear to your soul and you make your bones tremble whenever you do something wrong. That's his motivation. That's, his, that's what he does. He shows force to motivate you to not go crazy and cause panic and havoc and chaos in society. That was R.C. Sproul's definition. I read this to you last week. The government is a structure that is endowed legally with the right to use force to compel its citizens to do certain things and not do other things. Force to compel. Wally Cleaver. I've got to read this one again, too. Wally Cleaver said, The city's got to maintain law and order. You can't do that without kicking people around. You got swords to, to whack people's heads off with if they don't comply with law and order. Law and order has to take place. 
By the way, too, I think this verse, Romans chapter 13, verse 4, is the verse that gives the primary reason that God instituted government among men in the first place. This is the number one reason that government exists. It is the main purpose for government, and that is to protect law-abiding citizens and punish lawbreakers. That's the main reason government exists. That's not the only one, but that is the norm. And even though there are exceptions and many things have slipped through the cracks, uh, people who did crimes got away with it, and people who didn't, uh, didn't do crimes got punished, there are exceptions and things went wrong. Every society, every culture gets it wrong. But today it's horrible out there. But that really is the main purpose of government. Now you have defense. You have, um, uh, whatever, what else I write down here? Public commerce. You've got to set up things so that people can make money. So the economy will grow if you're the government. You've got to do things to set up certain standards of morality and infrastructure. You've got to set up uh, rules in place that bring safety to the people that you are governor over. There are things that you have to do as a governor to bring welfare to the people. Now, each one of those would require a book. That's all I'm going to say about them today. The main one is protect law-abiding citizens, punish lawbreakers. That's what the government does. And you do that, you enforce that with a sword. If you do not comply... With law and order, the government's going to kick you around. And it's going to kick you around in ways that you don't like it. It ain't going to feel good and you're not going to be happy with your life because a sword is going to come and cut your head off. Robert Haldane, uh, uh, I'll finish with this. He, he wrote uh, his commentary. It's about that thick of Romans. He lived back in the early 1800s. He wrote, The institution of civil government is a dispensation of mercy. In other words, this is God being merciful to us, giving us government. And its extent and its extensive and its existence is so dispensable, indispensable. If I could read, it would be a great quote. And its existence is so indispensable that the moment it ceases under one form, it reestablishes itself in another. The world, ever since the fall, has been in such a state of corruption and depravity that without the powerful obstacle presented by civil government to the selfish and malignant passions of men, it would be better to live among the beasts of the forest than in a human society. If you didn't have a government, you'd be better off on a National Geographic channel uh, living in the woods than with a society of people. Because they will break in your house and steal stuff and kill you to get your stuff. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. Unless you're stronger than they are and you can stop them. And as soon as its restraints are removed, man shows himself in his real character. He quotes uh, Judges, when there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. When you read the last three chapters of the book of Judges, you'll see all the dreadful consequences of everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. You submit to the government because God told you to. That was his ordination. He instituted it just like he wants it to be. But you submit to the government because it's good for you. It's not only good for you, it's good for everybody. That's what Paul's saying here. It's good for you to have a governor. It's good for you to have a king. So while you have a king that's doing good for you, then honor him. Let's pray. Father, praise you again today that you have given us your word that reveals to us what your will is for us concerning uh, our attitude our relationship, our responsibility to our own government. Lord, and you know all of our hearts here and uh, most of us here, most of us are pretty conservative folks. And we stress out a lot with the government having control over us and our freedom. But Lord God, I pray that you would make us a people who honor the king, who pray for the king, 
who obey the laws, conscientiously obey the laws, delighting, delighting to obey the laws so that we would be the best citizens this country has ever seen. And when they do come to punish us, it won't be because we broke law. It'll just be because they don't like you. Let that be all of us. Father, I pray that you will just be glorified in what uh, you have given us today concerning this issue in this election year. Father, I pray uh, that you will bless us at home, keep us safe, keep us wise as we start to feel the, the pressure of not, or start to feel the pressures that we've had under quarantine go away, that we would uh, not get so crazy out there that we would do something uh, that would be harmful to other people or ourselves. Even though we are going to have a good time, keep us safe and keep us wise. Protect our country. Give us a good day. Just bless us with everything good because you are a good God. You love your people. We love you, Lord, and we pray that you'll be uh, honored in our lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.